thank you everyone choosing to watch this. It's start of a series that's going to give you a chance to hear from a range of elite athletes with varied backstories, uh, hoping to run them roughly every two weeks. Um, we're lucky today to have uh, Matt and George Rossiter joining us from their family home in Newbury. Okay, they are brothers who now compete for Leander Club and the GB national team. So I hopefully I'm going to be able to bring them in to the chat. Okay, here they are, Matt and George. Hello. Hi everyone. Hello, Hello. and welcome to welcome to Swadian Park. Okay. Um, before we start, it's a strange time for all of us at the moment. Um, could you tell us something about how how you're finding the lockdown period? Um, how is it, how's your training going, I guess, a way to start? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, quite a good question, actually, Chris. And I think, um, just so for context for everyone listening, normal day-to-day -day life involves a lot of training. Um, so George and I both rode full-time on the Great Britain national team, so that we normally train three times a day, and yeah, so eat, train, sleep, um, repeat, and currently we're back at our parents' house. Um, and, if, and in reality, it's not a lot different to when we're training at the national centre. So we, there's probably like less driving around, and mum buys our food <laughs> when normally we we go to the shop ourselves. But otherwise, it's quite similar so i actually feel a bit guilty because lots of people are probably finding it quite difficult whereas i'm actually having a fairly nice time like i'm very lucky to george and i get on very well most of the time um <laughs> so yeah just train eat lie on the sofa do some puzzles we've got a couple of cats so gen generally i feel quite lucky that my work as such hasn't been too affected and actually quite enjoying things um, yeah, i think feel very grateful that i've got a small garden at home um, so yeah, quite enjoying it really. Yeah, that's very that's very interesting. That kind of slant of almost feeling guilty that you are able to be doing a lot of the things that you do like to do at the moment. Um, I guess George, how would your parents agree? Do you think they're enjoying having you around the house so much? Uh, I think they like it. Yeah, because yeah. we, you know, we're not here very often normally. I'm sure if it keeps going for months, they'll start to get sick of us, and they're probably sick of the uh, the noise of the Erg fan, but um, the food bill. Yeah, I think they like it. Um, we try and do our bits around the house, cooking, cleaning, um, and contributing to buying some of the food. So yeah. I think they're, they're quite happy with it all so far, but hopefully it doesn't go on forever. Yeah, I was going to say, well, what, five, five, six weeks in, let's see see if it's the same yeah. in 12 weeks. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so you guys, you're both, uh, you're both kind of in line to be in and around the team for Tokyo to be competing this summer. Just wondered how you are coping with the the news that you are likely to have a 12 month delay to that because there are there are obviously some parallels there albeit at a different different level of competition with our our rowers they were planning for national schools for henley women's for henley um for some of them and obviously and our younger rowers were looking forward to their first ever regatta this summer um so yeah how 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 are you kind of dealing with that your world changing by 12 months um it's obviously a very strange scenario, and I think actually thinking about, you know, the selection will be reopened, so we don't know, nothing is, a, um, is guaranteed, so that, that will all have to happen again. But to look that far into the future is quite difficult, and I think probably my brain hasn't really got around how, how long there is to go until the things that were going to be quite soon, like 12 months, a year is a long time. Mm. So I think coping with it is breaking it down. So we, every other week we have some sort of performance ergo and it's not hugely important, um, but it does help break down this long kind of void, which we don't know when it's going to end. Um, so we just focus on the training and trying to do well on any of those tests on the ergo really. And that breaks down um, the long gap that in reality quite hard to get your head around yeah so that that idea of having kind of small small term yeah. short term goals for you to be yeah. thinking if, about if, if you're trying to motivate yourself for something that's you know that schools henley for, for us olympic trials is about a year away or more that's very difficult whereas if you say right in two weeks i want to smash it whatever it is 
and that's that'll that'll keep you training hard because you want to try and do well on that yeah. and beat your beat your previous best. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that, I think, uh, yeah. I guess Sorry. that's a thing. That's the theme that goes wider than just the sport, doesn't it? Every day, people's daily lives are now about small kind of short term things they're going to do that day, rather than I'm planning yeah. to do this next week, see my friends next week, and all of that kind of thing. Um, yeah. I guess I guess a place to to start with your your rowing story if you like you both got into the sport at Abingdon school um so what was it that made you firstly have a go but most importantly want to keep going back to to sport because your rowing at school is something that the uh, the audience at our school can obviously relate to from an age point of view anyway um so our dad rowed for Cambridge at university and did the boat race um so I think I wasn't actually that keen on rowing. I think George and I have always done lots of other sports. So it was uh, rugby, cricket, football, hockey, golf, tennis. Um, and we both played musical instruments. So it's basically just like doing everything under the sun. And my, I thought I should give rowing a go for dad's sake. So in J14s, I was in the octo um, and kind of enjoyed it. I was a bit I was a bit chubby and I was called Big Bow Matt. So I was bow of the octo. And I... I I found that quite hard. I wouldn't say I was bullied, but I found it quite difficult at the time. And I was, I was really relieved when I could go and play cricket. I did national schools and then play cricket after half term. Um, and then I started to grow a little bit and was less big bow mat and started to beat a few people. And I, I kind of wanted to prove, prove people wrong in my J15 and J16 years because I think people laughed, not like laughed. I had like big ambitions to to achieve. And I think. I still wasn't dead set on it until about J 16s when I, I, I kind of found my my footing in the school. Like I made some amazing friends. I really enjoyed getting fit and training hard, and started to kind of move up the ranks. And I think that's why I kind of um, stuck with it. And I'm, I'm now thirty, so I've been rowing for uh, sixteen years. Um, but no, I, I really enjoy it. I think George and I are both rowers. Like we, I haven't I haven't sculled for years. Um, and I think if I had to do the single skill, I'd probably stop. I wouldn't have the motivation to carry. And I really love the team element of rowing. Um, and having them was a great footing in that. And I, I'm still like best mates with five or six guys I used to row with at school. So yeah, and I'm sure, hopefully some of you guys like are making really awesome friendship groups and will make lifelong friends. I'm not just saying that. Like you form incredible bonds with people you go through this journey with. So very grateful I took rowing up and stuck with it. Yeah. So George, do you find? The, 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 um, the kind of social element that Matt mentioned there, does that chime with you and your thoughts when you think back to school as well? Yeah, massively. Um, so when we do, you know, we race in the eight um, at school and like the goal throughout, I started a little bit later than that, but you always dream of being in the first eight. And I remember when I first watched them go past and Matt would have been in it doing arms only square blades or something. And I thought it was, remarkable and ridiculous how in time they were and the noise is a bit all um, and then when you actually get there it's, well lucky enough to get in the crew that's very exciting and then you know in that school's campaign school's head Henley um, and actually the people I'm still in touch with from school are almost exclusively from rowing um, and I that doesn't bother me because they were the most similar people to me and we shared great experiences we shared bad days together obviously when results didn't go the right way but and I think potentially even stronger than racing together is when you do really hard training sessions together you know you're walking back from the boathouse and you think but yeah we did that together that was freaking awesome yeah. um so yeah and, and the same with uni as well like it didn't for me it just got stronger and stronger so if anyone's umming and ahhing um I you know it got even the same, if not even better, when I went to uni. Yeah. So you, I guess you've both been on the the two sides. If we imagine a scene, you're at Henley Royal Regatta. For you guys, it was the eight. For the junior girls in yeah. the country, it's been the quad so far, and it could become an eight at some point in the near future. What's it like being part of the crowd wearing, for you, it was your pink and white blazers. For us, it's our navy and gold blazers clapping the crew out and then what what's it like being on the other side and hold carrying the boat as you walk out as part of the school first boat to race at Henley what what are those feelings like I think they're very different yeah <laughs> but both absolutely amazing um 
So clapping the mouths, I probably would have done that for Matt's crew when I was younger, and I've done it, of course, since since I left um, for the guys younger than me. And you have an immense sense of kind of pride, and I guess it's almost like an army or an armada. You're like, you know, you feel very proud and strongly for your team or school or whatever. Um, and then the other side of it, carrying the boat out, is uh, you know, you wouldn't need many people there for it to feel very special. You get goosebumps. You're really nervous, obviously, but also it's holding back tears, aren't you? It's yeah, so emotional. really nervous, but also excited. And you, you know, you have a peek out from where your boat's racks, and you see these people, and you think, "Oh, bloody hell!" And then you carry the boat out, and you, it's a very good, very special feeling. And you just, it just makes you want to win. Makes yeah. you want to race does every make, day. Does it make you feel seven foot tall when you see all those yes. people there? For yeah, you, you sit in the boat and you. You've got your sunglasses on and you look up at them and you think, yeah, we're going to win. Yeah. It's actually it's actually one of the sad things how um, like hopefully some of the girls will get to race at Women's Henley and Henley Royal. Like on the national team, you you don't get the chance to race very often. Like we um, race internally a lot and then we'll get to race Boar's Head, Eight Head of the River, maybe Henley two out of four years and then all the World Cups, whereas in this year the, the national team wasn't going to race Henley whereas Henley is an absolutely incredible event and I almost wish I'd kind of appreciated it more but it's very hard to appreciate in the moment um but yeah walking out at Henley Regatta is like something incredibly special and like yeah but we, we often say that um obviously for us school boy but also now school girl events at Henley are some of if not the best events because you know you're rowing with people who you've seen every day for however many years um and, and then you get to race at henley with them and i think henley is amazing regardless of uh, the event but the, the school boy and girl events are seriously amazing and hopefully they bring in a, an, an eight to join the quads for the girls yeah well that, george, that george and i was sorry george and i was saying that we Neither of us, George went to Newcastle University, I went to Durham, um, and neither of us won Henley with our school or university, and we we won with Mr Body at Leander and then subsequently, but it never quite, I think the real brotherhood was with your with your school and uni, and I think the bonds that you have, you like it, you know, in lessons together, you go to training, and then you move into Henley House, I think it's yeah, something incredibly yeah. special. Well, you, you I actually miss it, thinking about it. Yeah, you're, you're in each other's pockets for yeah. six or seven years, aren't you? So, yeah, yeah that's that's very understandable. Um, so, in in the rowing world, you are one of, you are a fairly well-known set of brothers, there's lots of brothers that do rowing. I wondered how much of a part you think being siblings has played in your rowing experience. I guess if we start at school, okay, that's quite pertinent for us. We've got a few sets of siblings in our club who I'm sure would be interested to hear how you found it at school, um, kind of being brothers within the same club. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. So we, we actually didn't overlap that much at school. So Matt's two years older. Um, but the reason I started rowing was that I more so than Matt carried on with cricket, so I didn't I didn't start rowing immediately. And then in one um, year in 2007, I went to watch Nat schools, and I thought, wow, this is in it's insane! So many people, so many boats. I thought that's pretty cool. And then I went to watch Matt racing the Junior Worlds in Beijing, uh, and they won. And I thought, okay, I'm probably going to have to give this a go because two amazing experiences so that that is one of the reasons why I started um, and for me for Matt I was just some chopper in the J16 A crew just um, but Matt was in the first day you know the strongest guy uh, and it was quite inspirational really to try and emulate that and, yeah. and I guess for you Matt I know George as kind of as is his nature played himself down there for for you, I'm guessing he wasn't just some chopper in the J16. He was someone that you, with what you were doing, you wanted to, you know, give him something that he was proud of as well. Would that be fair? Yeah, I think um, that's actually a very good question. I think looking back on it, I probably gave George a bit of a hard time. Like I remember 
he wore tracksuit trousers in the boat instead of leggings. And I was like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> in front of all of his mates, all of my mates. And I actually feel really embarrassed that I did that because I think I embarrassed you. That was like not very nice. But I think we were quite close to school, but then I've become a lot closer since. Um, and I, yeah, I'm, I'm an old man now, so I can't really remember. But I'm sure I was very kind of, yeah, proud that George was doing it. But I think more so recently, like, it's a shame that George and I are both on stroke side. We did try the pair once, but it was absolutely hopeless. But I think um, <laughs> a lot of the selection, so early you asked how it felt that the Olympics was cancelled. And yes, it was disappointing, but almost we hadn't got as far as thinking about that because the selection for the British team is so ferocious that all of your headspace is involved with getting selected. And I think nothing, a big motivator for me is to like, is to like show your ability to your peers to like gain respect and for me to have George's respect in a rowing sense is probably up there with one of the most like powerful motivators mm -hmm. um and I think it's very useful that we we, we live together in Henley um and we drive together every day to training so it's quite nice like we all kind of talk about training and how it's all going and we love to, to speculate about what the coaches are thinking and who's going to get selected but it's it's definitely a big a big driver and I think We've not really talked about this before, but I'm sure that both of us are, have have improved because that we've pushed each other on. Like, there's no way we probably got to the standard that we have without each other pushing us on. And that's been throughout everything. It's like George was always better than me at PlayStation as a kid, and it really annoyed me. And I wanted to be better. I just like punch him in the arm, or like golf or cricket in the garden. It's always been like trying to be better than each other. And I think. We're not as competitive as we were, but I think it's been a very constructive um, like relationship pushing each other on. Yeah. I, I would say also um, just like learning experiences. So for me to be two years behind, uh, basically anything I've done, Matt has done it to some extent or entirely before. So I'll say, oh, that's cool. And he'll say, oh, this is how it was like for me, you know, passing down experiences and, you know, trials or anything whether it be domestic race or an international race or a trial or an ergo test we can share he can share his experiences with me when i was growing up um and now we're sort of age is less important we can share it together yeah. because it's quite useful george is that it's funny because i'm i am two dollars but george is far more level-headed than me so it's normally him <laughs> consoling me with far far more rational advice we well we used to run together mr body so and you know how my brain is the right mess sometimes no i i've got lots of Lots of good memories of all of that time. Um, so it's, it's interesting because you would think you hear lots of stories about siblings doing the same sport or uh, being in close proximity a lot of the time and it not being an easy relationship. And you'd have thought, you know, with you guys, you row together, you live together, you were competing against each other um, kind of a, a fair amount of the time. You both being stroke siders, you both being very good in the stroke seat. Has, has it caused any tension that you can really think of um not really somehow um i think for a long time and this isn't me being modest it's just a fact matt was in the team quite high up in the national team and i'm of course trying to get into it so really i was competing against the guys at the bottom of the team and he wasn't one of them so that was very much him trying to help me get into the team yeah. and it, it was never in um, risk of taking his seat um, in the last couple of years I have been fortunate enough to pip him at a couple of trials but it's never felt um, it's never felt like either of us was going to be the one to knock the other out of a boat or out of the team so it hasn't really um, it hasn't really come to that and I, I don't think hopefully it won't that would, that would be horrific if we had to seat be seat race that would be absolutely horrific yeah, I think I think it's quite lucky. Like we're we're brothers at the end of the day, and we'll be brothers when we finish rowing. So I think if if I know the uh, I know B Cook was at school, and her, her we we both rowed with her older brothers, and they had, they seat raced they were seat raced together at university, and I think that was like quite a stressful moment for the entire Cook family. Yeah. Um, but I think to, to date, like we've been very good about it, and I think yeah, I think if if yeah if george beat me all the time i'd find that quite difficult <laughs> but yeah no, i think we've had final trials this year and final trials last year was probably the two 
days where we had contrasting results. Mm. So last year, I probably performed above expectation, Matt below, and then this time it was the opposite. So those are probably the two results which have come closest to causing any issues. But we're both sensible enough to not go to the others. Yeah, we both want each other to do well. So it's not it's not like it's a combat sport. You can't you can't affect the other person. Yeah. It's you versus the clock, basically. Um, so yeah. So it's I guess it's, it's um, look, looking out for each other, even when your day m- might have gone way better than the other or way worse than the other. You kind yeah. of are sensitive to each other's psyche, if you like. So yeah. I guess from hearing what you say, it's almost like the instead of tension, it's, it's almost created a greater sense of unity between you. This fact that you're on the same sort of trajectory, looking for the same things. Um and I wonder, are there any moments that really stick out to you as a, a moment that you shared together doing doing a great thing or, you know, having having a great time with a group of people or something, but where you were both you were both really centrally involved in it? Uh, I think two two stories. Uh, I, I was on the I was on the wearing the blazer side of Henley Regatta in 2018 and 2019, George won the visitors, which is the 2017 the Intermediate Fours event, and he and they won that, which I which I was so proud. I think I like almost cried. And then the following year, George um, was in the pair racing, and they were three or four legs down at halfway, and ended up winning by about a foot. And that was a ridiculous moment. And I. I sweat lots at the rest of the time. I was in my blazer. I ran from, hopefully lots of the girls have been to Henley. I've had the chance to, but I ran through stewards, ran to the boat base. And I was pissing with sweat. I like had my top button undone, my tie loose. And I was like, they run. And that was, that was, that was an absolutely amazing moment. But I think we haven't really had a chance to row together that much. Like we, at school, we perfectly missed each other. And then probably the best moment was um, the summer when we rode with Mr. Body at Leander, when we, we went to Amsterdam and won um, quite like a big international race, that, that still sticks out as a very, very special moment in my rowing career. And then we won Henley a few month, a few weeks later in slightly strange circumstances. But I think that just, so in answer to your question, Chris, I'd say not really any specifics, just a lot of like very nice memories of just training together and going through hard times and then sitting in a, in the sofa in the in the crew room to relax together like the whole journey of it is what i look back very fondly on not necessarily like in that exact moment i don't know if you can remember any yeah i think the third day that day in 2017 henley matt had won stewards with the british four um and then i had not made the team but then managed to win the visitors four so that was that was a really really epic day um and i'd agree with the rowing the eight together was pretty cool and that Amsterdam race does stick um, stick in the mind. Um, but what, what I would say is when just going on training, like the senior training camps, I've, Matt's been on lots now, I've still not been on loads. So they're still quite novel and exciting. And just being on those camps together is really cool because it's not that different to normal life because you're still eating, sleeping, rowing, basically. But you're in a nice hotel in a hot country rowing on a cool lake. And that is... Training camps are some of the best times because it's not as stressful as racing, obviously, and some of the stresses of everyday life, i.e. cooking, driving, whatever, aren't there. And so you're just there basically living living your dream yeah. together, which is pretty cool. Yeah. I remember, um, I, we don't, girls, we don't always wear this, these clothes, <laughs> um, but we, we, we were sat next to each other on the flight because obviously we have the same surname, and I took a selfie of our silly clothes and put it on the family on the Rossi's family whatsapp group I was like oh we're on the way to the world cup and I felt that was like a really nice moment that we were both like flying the flag for the family yeah that's that's awesome your mum and dad must love that as well um yeah. I guess another another area just moving on that will it will strike a chord with some of our rowers um but also people from all sports everywhere is injury um something i remember seeing you guys deal with in really close proximity during your careers and I remember having some chats with both of you during some fairly dark times where you were having to really cope with some challenging things 
be interesting to hear what what happened and how you coped with the fallout of those injuries. So I guess if we go in chronological order, and Matt, we'll start with you. So we've heard a few of the bits. Things were progressing like a dream, really. When you were at school, you won the Junior World Championships in Beijing in 2007. Um, next year, you were in the under-23 team when you were still at school, uh, which is obviously not the not the norm. Um, but then what what happened? What happened for you after that? Um, yeah, as, as you said, uh, things seem to be progressing quite well. Um, I think when I, so I, I was at school, I left school in 2008, and I think, I'm not, I'm not bitter about it at all, that's just how it was, but we didn't look after ourselves very much, like we didn't have foam rollers, or we, would, we wouldn't stretch. Our coach, our coach used to joke that you'd be like, right, let's have a stretch, do this, and then be like, right, off we go. Um, course of minute, core training wasn't the thing. We didn't really do any weight training, and I think uh, I was fairly like fit and strong, so putting quite a lot of force through my body, but I had no control for it. So I think um, I was just putting a lot of force through my back, and it and it must have done like a bit of damage then. And then I got to U, to U, Durham Uni, and my back just kind of just fell apart, and I found that very difficult um, because a few guys that I'd rode with like. Uh, George Nash, who I won the four with at Junior Worlds, he went to the London Olympics and won a bronze, and then subsequently went to Rio and won the gold medal. And I found that very hard seeing them do that when I thought it would be nice for me to have a chance. Like There was nothing saying that I would have gone or even been close to selection, but I, I, was, I was not in a boat at all. I, did, I found that very difficult, and I think it took me probably a year to really work out what the right plan was for me and I think previously I'd just kind of half been in the program half rowing half not and I, my back wasn't right and it just needed to say right we're not okay and I kind of seeked out a, a, a physio and we came up with a plan and I think that's something I take with it now like finding someone I, I fully trust with and committing to a plan um, and then it took me about six months through lots of swimming and stretching and kind of catching up on all the core training and flexibility that I'd missed kind of at school and uni um, and then gradually got back got back rowing and I, I'd kind of taken a job in London um, and then was rowing at University of London in the evenings and gradually gradually I kind of increased the rowing I was doing and then moved to Leander and now I'm in the national team but I think it was an incredibly challenging time and I think I was almost lucky that at school I never had any setbacks with injury like I had little tweaks I kind of saw rib for a few weeks or bits and bobs um but it all kind of kept caught up with me at uni and I wish I'd kind of looked after myself a bit more but I think just the the way the junior rowing scene works now is people do look after themselves and spend much more time looking after their bodies which is absolutely brilliant um but yeah and I think so I think like injuries do happen like um rowing is a tough sport um but definitely if, if you set a plan and kind of stick to it there's no reason why no one can kind of get over any injury. Yeah, that's that's interesting to hear your kind of your your account of your story, Matt. With George, it's not you were not in a dissimilar position to Matt as you were coming out of juniors. You'd done done some really good stuff there. Twenty, you're 20 years old. You just got selected for the senior European Championships in 2012. And then what was your what was your story that summer? Um, yeah, so. Like you say, I was selected for that, which was um, kind of sort of the, the team just below the um, London Olympic team, which was, you know, it had been quite a quick rise, which was obviously very exciting. I'd say just to go backwards a little bit, what Matt said about not um, having not done, you know, the things that you need to do, like stretching and the core stability, he had warned me. And I'd always just say, oh, that's weird that you've had back problems. My back's fine. Yeah. And I'd kick myself because I could have, I could have very easily um, prevented the things that happened just with diligent stretching core stability. And you don't need to do loads. It's just little and often, you know, a little bit each day or every other day. But um, I didn't. I thought I was invincible because I never got a sore back. But if you don't look after yourself, it will catch up with most people. Um, so my back... Uh, I had a disc issue with my back, so I couldn't compete at the Europeans. You couldn't touch your toes, could you? There were lots. Of, yeah, I was not in. A, I was not in a particularly good way, and I didn't. I didn't row properly again for about six or seven months. And 
luckily I came back just in time for my final year of uni, Buck Shigata and Henley, and just about made it um, into the under-23 team again. And then I thought, right, I'm never going to let this slip again. And after a couple of months of plain sailing, I let it slip again and I hurt my back again. And that's, so the first lesson is to look after it in the first place. And then, but injuries do happen. Just keep, keep the things up that help because they're not that time consuming and they will look after you for a long time if you keep doing them. Um, but I got back and since then, touch wood, I've been diligent consistently for the last, uh, uh, three or four years now, maybe even more, um, and it's been good on the injury front. Yeah, you still do stuff before every year, didn't you? Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess the advice for how you guys have dealt with have dealt with things is, like you say, in the first place, be diligent about the things that you yeah. you know are kind of gold standard for how I should look after yeah. my body. But then, yeah. if things don't go, if things do go wrong, if you like, yeah, um, kind of being trying to stay calm about it and yeah. then work bit by bit through it how, how have you found your interaction with coaches have coaches and physios have they been has it been really good talking to them and kind of being quite open with them about things uh, yeah I think I think it's hard for coaches when um, you have an injury because naturally they're going to want to focus on um, the rowers who are able to go out on the boat and do every session but I think coaches always want to help. And even if they are busy, if you seek them out and say, right, this is what I've done, this is where I'm at, and constantly update them, I'm sure all the coaches are, are really good at chasing up anyway. But you can go to them proactively and say, this is where I'm at, this is what I need to do. And actually, uh, Chris, you and uh, the other coaches have probably experienced, had similar experiences. So seek out advice from them or people like us um because people are there to help yeah so um, i guess communicating and staying in touch are really very important because you can feel uh, very separate from the rest of the team and you build this amazing team like we said before and if you're not going out rowing you will feel a bit separate so it's important not to um disengage from everyone like yeah. try and stay as much a part of it as possible stay positive and i, and I remember you, you say about staying calm I once had a flare up and I, I messaged my physio an email and the subject line was panic. <laughs> <laughs> and she replied saying, first rule of injuries is never panic. Yeah. <laughs> and then gave me some very calm advice and it was all fine in a few days. So, yeah. so you, you it's also quite, sorry, I was sorry, just going to yeah, say, Chris, it's quite, um, I say, if you, if you do get injured, like it's one of the, the big life lessons for me, like in life as much as we hope that it will just be a, a kind of a linear path from like to success like that's not like how it happens in real life so you know, things will go well things will go bad you know, I think injuries I still George still probably deals with them much better than me but it's taught me to to not kind of freak out like it, no, nothing will ever go perfectly like so my growing career my back went bad then it then, it, then it's got better but like everyone's parents at home or with your schoolwork or maybe a boyfriend or with friends, things won't go to plan. And it's, and that's not the end of the world. It's kind of how you deal with that. that will like build you as a person and definitely make you stronger for it. But yeah. I think coming through a back in back injury, I feel like very strong and like I can back myself to kind of get through adversity a bit more than maybe I did previously. Yeah. I would also say there are things, if you stick to them, there are things that you can improve so quickly. So I remember my physio once saying, your hamstring flexibility is so poor, it's really affecting your back. And she showed me how to do a proper hamstring stretch. And I was like, right, I'm going to do this two or three times every day. And I remember I'd go back and see her every week. And after a month, she was like, that is unbelievable improvement. And that's the same with your core or with stretching. Like, if you do it, if you're diligent to do it consistently and regularly you can you can make it improvements so quickly yeah. so it's almost like, like it's almost like you're turning something that was a disadvantage to you into your edge if you like yeah it's what, like I, I was um very very inflexible and i see some of the guys today and i think they're an injury waiting to happen and now i pride myself on uh flexibility because i keep it i keep it up and it's important because it, it'll keep you in a safe position in the boat and it'll allow you to train as hard as you need to because you've looked after your body and it'll look after you yeah that's that's really interesting i think just just going back to something you said 
about how you can, when you are injured, how you act can make you feel isolated. I think, do you think it's, have you experienced times where the actions of your squad mates have helped that not happen? So they, while you've been doing your training separately to them, say if you're on a bike and they're out on the water, yeah. have there been times where people, you've actually been really grateful for how people have, you know, acted around you and kept you in the loop? I guess yeah. at a time where yeah, yeah. You, you like you say you can feel like you're not actually part of things. Yeah, yeah definitely. So um so when I hurt my back for my final year of uni, I'd been you know, I was the captain of the men's team, um and I was supposed to be one of the top guys, but I couldn't I couldn't row for months and I was feeling increasingly uh, not part of it. But then I remember they, we used to do a circuit session and That was the that was the ad break. Yeah. Off you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I remember someone saying, "Oh, come on, wheel your bike into the erg gym and do your intervals while we're doing the weight circuit," and that was brilliant because I was training with them. So that was one time, and I remember they'd all been down at the river doing a hard session, and I was just doing some core and maybe a bike in the gym, and then they were going for a big, maybe not um, transferable to at school, but. We went to have a huge fire up in some cafe, as we would after a long, hard session. They said, come on. And then I just went along as well. And you just, it's not just the rowing that makes you part of the team. It's the stuff, other stuff as well. Yeah. Whether it's socially or land training or whatever. Um, I'd say the land training, you try and, you don't need to be doing the same thing, but in the same room, you know, you're all listening to music or whatever. It can make a massive difference. Yeah. So there's there's something there really for for everyone, isn't there? Whether it's you, whether it's you that's injured, or it's yeah. you that's even not if injured. it's just the message saying, you know, I know it's not fun being injured. How are you getting on? Are you doing all right? It makes a world of difference. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've had messages from people like I I wear my heart on my sleeve, and my like close friends can tell when I'm not quite right. And well, you're kind of kind of there, kind of not. But just just literally a text being like, oh, how's it going? You're not on the program like, I hope you're okay it can mean mean the world and I think it just if everyone's looking out for each other that that makes a really united squad that makes a massive difference especially when you're slightly a low ebb I think it's yeah. really important to look out for your friends. I think that's something that's useful for all of us to know yeah. whether it's you know young athletes watching uh coaches watching and listening about things like this um and also I guess for you guys to talk about it as well um because quite often you come to conclusions by actually talking about it don't you um i think it's probably a good time to go to some questions from the rowers now okay so maddy asked how how are you finding keeping motivation in this period you've kind of touched on it about little bits in between your um you know in your daily training and your weekly training having certain things to focus on have you found that there are have you say considered elements of your armory if you like as an athlete that you think this is a time that you might be able to improve or make some changes to yeah definitely so um for me i used to be quite good on the erg i used to have quite good 2k and stuff like that but in the last few years it's, it's not really progressed and i've sort of been very much reliant on uh you know good technique and good results on the water which is of course the most important thing but in the GB rowing team, the head coach is quite keen on the erg scores, and mm. obviously we can't go rowing, so we're training on the erg. And I'm just thinking, right, this is a proper chance to get the numbers down again. Um, and it doesn't have to be thrashing every session, but I'm trying to work on a few technical points and just trying to be really consistent and trying to get you know as much fitness and improvement as I can get in this period. Um, yeah, because I guess it's I, think, a, I, think, I guess it's a time for you where almost no one's watching, and yeah, you can exactly. in your daily training you can try something without any. I guess fear can be a very powerful thing that holds you back in sport. Yeah. This is a time yeah. for everyone, whatever their level or whatever their sport, where they can train without fear and they can try yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. That's that's really that's really cool, George. Um, Emily, Emily's asked another question, so she's one of our younger rowers. She said. 
did you guys find it hard choosing between rowing and other clubs when you were at school? I guess certainly uh, when when you were younger down the school. Yeah, well, yeah, it was very hard actually. So um, in my didn't row obviously before arriving at Abingdon, age thirteen. So like Matt said earlier, we've been doing pretty much anything you can imagine. Then in my first year of Abingdon. Um, through the terms, I did rugby, hockey, and cricket. Cricket probably being my my best sport, coinciding with the summer, yeah. coinciding with rowing, basically. And then having watched Matt, um, I thought oh, I'll have a go in the second term, but I, I will play cricket again. Um, and so there was there was a year or so when it was really fifty fifty, um, and I, I wouldn't I don't really know how I decided. I think. I think I just knew the satisfaction I got from rowing. I thought I probably had more potential in rowing based on what had happened, but I think the satisfaction of it, maybe the physical side of it compared to cricket, but I think I just knew um, it was what I wanted to do. And if you want, there's always space for some other things, but if you want to make progress, obviously you have to focus most of your energies into a um, specific thing. I don't know if you, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. And, and in life, uh, you gradually have to to cut down, which I found really difficult. Like a, it happens with your subjects. Like a, when you when you start at school, you do uh, probably 10, 11 GCSEs. And then um, then it goes to four ASs and three A-levels. I was like, that's, that's really hard. And then I played the piano and the cello and I, I ditched the piano because I was rubbish. That's got nothing to do with it. That wasn't a choice. Um, but then with sport, yeah, you do, you do everything and you gradually have to choose your path, which is really difficult. And you almost need a fairy godmother god to say, Matt, do these subjects, kick over the cello, do rowing and rugby. Like, it's very, very difficult. And I think it's just one of those things. I think it's important to talk to talk to your parents, talk to your, your friends, talk to uh, your coaches, your teachers, and gradually you're kind of it'll become clear and I think my mum always said just do do what makes you happy and do what you kind of enjoy doing I think that's the kind of best rule of thumb yeah. but there's no it is very difficult and but I think take solace and it's not just you having to make those tough decisions everyone throughout life has to make compromises with the path that they take and you'll no doubt make the make the right decisions yeah I guess doing doing things that you enjoy if they are viable is really good advice to take out of that um question from Mara she just um would like to know a little bit more about the nutrition that you guys experience um kind of if you think about when you were at school and how you do now um the uh, the amount of food that you need to eat to be able to do your training I guess let's start there so so it's a lot <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk you do you want me to go through a normal day or a lockdown day? Do a, let's do let's do a lockdown day at the moment because okay. that's something okay. that we can all relate to. So it's it's a bit um it's a few hours behind, but anyway, I'll talk you through it. So we'll wake up we're waking up a bit later than normal, which is very nice. A bit probably an hour extra sleep, so we're getting up around eight, and then having a, a medium sized breakfast. So I'll have um just a fairly big bowl of shreddies and maybe a banana. And then we probably won't start our erg until about 10 o'clock. Um, and so around half 11, roughly, we'll have basically second breakfast. But it's pretty much lunchtime. So that'll be a big meal. Usually beans, eggs, bread, uh, bacon as well, which is not the best nutrition, but it keeps us going. Um, and then we'll have a late lunch, which will be... Uh, to be honest, that's, that's a meal where usually we have a very healthy, balanced meal at training with carbs, meats, good veg. Whereas nutritionally, that's probably actually where we're missing out at the moment. We'll probably either have some leftovers from the night before or it'll be, you know, ham and cheese sandwich with some crisps, which isn't a disaster, but it's not, it's not fantastic. And then we'll have a, a good large meal in the evening. So three, three big meals with a, with a small breakfast at the start. Um, and I think, yeah, uh, we, we always, we often joke about this. And I think, like I mentioned earlier, that the, like with my stretching and my core, it wasn't really a thing when we were at school. The same was with kind of sports nutrition. And I think uh, George and I used to get the bus 
from our parents' house to school every day, which is just under an hour, and uh, training would finish at five, five, and then you'd literally leg it back to school at five ten, and then grab your bags and then leg it to the bus, which would leave at five twenty. So like often it was incredibly tired. So then you'd bang on the bus, like oh I'm coming in, um, and then you'd like pass out the back of the bus. Um, if you were older, the young, the young, the young ones would sit at the front, and then there's a gradual hierarchy <laughs> to the back. But you kind of sit at the back of the bus, pass out, the window goes all foggy because you're pissing with sweat, and then get home, and then we'd have dinner with mum about six or, or half six, but then I'd eat or drink nothing in that period from when I left the boathouse. Oh no, sorry, even before training, but I'd eat nothing for about two hours, which was really ropey. And now we're really hot on eating well, and you want to try and eat. As, as soon as you can after exercise or 30 minutes before um so i say a lot's changed like we get lots of good advice and you gradually just through getting older you you learn what's what's good for you um so yeah i wish i'd eaten a bit better at school yeah, so um, that's, that's i think i guess go, I think there's no there's no secret there's no special secret to nutrition and rowing i think it genuinely is just a good balanced diet yeah. so a good amount of veg good amount of fruit and then just lots of good carbs and some meat. Well, it doesn't have to be meat, but some source of protein. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we'll be eating crisps or bacon from time to time, which isn't great, but, you know, you're burning a lot of calories. Yeah. And actually, a calorie deficit is very bad. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we had a, we actually, there are some days where the meal times, because this strange period, our schedule's been a bit off. And after about a week, I was really struggling, and I weighed myself. I said, "Bloody hell, I've not just not been eating enough." Um, so it is important to not only eat well, but make sure you're eating enough, yeah. replacing what you've burnt on the erg or whatever training you're doing. Um, yeah, and I also think it's, it's, you don't need to live like a complete monk. Like I think at school, I I'd eat incredibly like clean food, so I wouldn't really eat many treats or naughties or um, when I was old enough to drink. I just, I just wouldn't drink at all. And then now, being a bit older, I think Pete, Pete Reed, I don't know if anyone remembers, Pete Reed did some advice last year on Instagram. Every day he gave some advice. And a lot of it was um, a bit far-fetched. But um, he gave some really good advice on kind of eating and drinking. He's like, the odd pint of beer or glass of wine won't, won't make a difference. And I think the same goes, like, if you're not at that age, like, I'll eat chocolate or sweet or crisps or anything like that. Training is really hard, and to, to cut everything out to live a really clean lifestyle, I think if you can do it, great. But for me, I know that that's just a bit too much. So I think, like George said, he's a really good balanced diet, which can include some sweets and chocolate. That's not a big deal. But just everything in moderation is, is I think, absolutely fine. Just from time to time. Yeah, time, yeah. To time yeah. That's great, guys. Um, last couple of questions for you. So Sasha Sasha's... Um, in our la she's in her last year at school at the moment, she's our captain of the boat, she asks how was it moving between clubs, whether it be going to uni or then later in life and then having to re-establish yourself in a new club with and then rowing with different people because um, you, bo you both experienced a decent number of clubs from school through uni and yeah. then to Leander and the national team Yeah, I would say when I went to uni I was quite kind of young and immature for an 18 year old so I was quite I was very nervous uh, about going I went to Newcastle so it's a long way a long way away obviously and I I remember just joining the rowing club was just I, I would have really struggled had I not had it and I'm sure other sports are similar but I think rowing is quite special in this regard you turn up and you've almost immediately got a group of friends you know, day one, you're the people in your in my hall. So I was like, oh, I don't know, I don't know about these this lot. And you go rowing, and you've got all these like-minded people who are so welcoming to any any newcomers, and and it, you know, with rowing, it takes time to establish, you know, whether you're going to make the A boat or B boat or whatever. Um, but that will that will happen if you do your best. You'll end up you'll end up doing well. But I, it was just an amazing welcome. And it's not like a big welcome. It's just you're now part of our of our little team, yeah. and um, that was quite special. And I think I would have struggled a lot had I not had it. Um, yeah, and then 
quite similar when I joined Leander, I would say. Um, I was a bit older, so less it was less daunting. But it's always it's always a bit strange going somewhere new. Mm. But it was it was a similar experience. You just you become very comfortable with people very quickly because you've all got similar goals and you're all similar people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's something up. quite special about rowing. Yeah, turn up for yourself and you're going to fit in with things. Yeah, 100%, because there'll be people just like you. Yeah. New yeah. new and old. Yeah, that's that's awesome advice. Again, um, Bethany, last, last two questions now. So Bethany asked, um, what has been the best part of your rowing career so far so let, let's go let's go best moment um so again put you on again you go first i don't know about best it. moment it's very very hard to pick one um uh i think the first i'll start with a more recent one i can't just do one i'm afraid when i i spent years basically from around 2012 i knew i was not miles away from being good enough to make the national team, but for various reasons, it didn't happen. And there was a while when I thought, oh, I'm, ne I'm never going to make it. I'm never even going to actually train at the building. That's that. Well, that's what the battle felt like it was for. And I remember um, in 2018, I'd had a good run at the trials throughout the season. And then the final set of trials, um, we made the final, which was you weren't really supposed to do if you weren't uh, one of the guys in the national team. And then got the call up. Um, my coach called me and said, oh, Jürgen's just called. He said, you're, you're down on Monday with them. And I just thought, that's, that's it. Like, I've actually, um, and, and it's been a bit up and down since then, but that moment there, realising that I had been deemed good enough to go and train with the national team was very, just very proud, I guess, very yeah. satisfying and made me feel great that all the sacrifices and all the hard work is worth it. Yeah. How about you, Matt? Um, yeah, I'll probably have to speak a few. Uh, one of the so so Abingdon School's biggest rival is Radley, um, and it was School's Head 2008, and we overtook Radley under Smith Hammersmith. Un, sorry, we overtook Radley underneath Hammersmith Bridge, um, and that was a really special moment. They were like our sworn enemies, um, and we were having a really good row. Like the, the boat was buzzing, like everyone was having a great time. Um, and yeah, that was a very special moment. And then in 2017, um, I made the national team and then did well at trials. And then I was selected in the Coxes Four. Um, and we didn't do like particularly well that season, but kind of being selected into the four was a really special moment. Um, and something I really like. And then a third one, it's, it's not my best moment, but something I'm very proud of. I, um, I'm not shy, but I've struggled with my mental health in the past. And we go on this awful training camp here called Sierra Nevada in in uh, January and December. But this is the January one, and I I had an awful time. My my mind was all over the place. It was horrific, and I had to dig really, really deep to kind of survive that training camp. Um, and it was literally just like minute by minute, just survived, complete the training. And then a week after we got back, we had to do a 2K. Um, and on that 2K, even in the warm-up, I was like, I can't do this. I don't I want to be anywhere but here right now. I broke 550 and got a PV for the first time. And I think I when I finished, I let out this like really embarrassing cheer. But I think all the emotion just came flooding out. Like I'd been in a really bad place, kind of physically and mentally, and I just didn't want to be doing it. But then to know that if you just like, really stick at it and dig deep we can achieve achieve great things i think looking back on that like really proud that i just stuck at it and i think the girls can take the lesson that like this situation is very strange and things will happen like you might not make a boat you might be injured you might like have a hard time at school but if you just dig deep like you can achieve amazing things all storms pass yeah and what's the other one T tough what's it tough times tough times don't last tough people do yes like that <laughs> yeah. I would also just very quickly say this isn't a moment it's uh, thankfully been quite a, a fair few moments whatever race it may be whether it's a heat or any Henley race particularly there's probably about an hour after winning a race where you feel you, that nothing can compare to it whether the race well whatever happened in the race like winning around at Henley 
you have an hour where you think you, the endorphins are through the roof and of course you'll start to become nervous for the next day or the next challenge or whatever but training is worth it because that feeling is so good even if it's you know an olympic champion winning a race at Met Regatta, they will still feel awesome like it's a great feeling regardless and actually it doesn't even need to be winning if your goal is to qualify for a final, I've come third in semi-finals qualifying for a final and it's felt so, so good. And that feeling is, will never get old. Yeah. It's seriously good. Yeah. So, so when you get it, enjoy it. Yeah, well, exactly. I've had times where I've not enjoyed it enough. Yeah, that's, that's again, really interesting to hear. Last one, guys, because um, I'm aware you've no doubt got another training session to go and do or some more food to eat. Um, Mad- Maddie's asked um, how how did you balance training at such a high level at uni with your studies um, and did did the rowing and the training you thought you were going to need to do at uni impact upon the course that you chose to take uh, I think I was lucky so I, I did geography and economics kind of a, a combined course and the contact hours weren't massive which was was helpful. Um, that's not to say I had guys I rode with who did medicine and engineering, um, but that is a busy a busy existence for them. But it's still manageable. But from my experience, um, it I mean you're more tired, but there is there is enough time in the day. The training is is was um, the timings are based around lectures, and there was enough time in the day to do everything and. There were times when um, I maybe let the rowing take over, but that was it. Didn't that didn't need to happen? That was just me being lazy. Oh. Whereas I, I never, whenever there were exams or essays coming up or needing to be done, there was plenty of time in the day, and I, I didn't have to let either take any hit yeah. because. And there's this theory that sportsmen and women achieve academically higher because I don't really know why it is but they're they're always switched on better at time management and just more driven and what and doing both makes you better at both yeah I guess if you really want to do something you're more likely to find the time to be able to do it well yeah yeah. Um, was it was it was it Maddie was it Maddie that asked the question yeah I think Maddie it's a really good question and like illogically you think how can I do two things some people only do their studies or we, we only just row um but i think sport and rowing particularly like forces structure on you i think it teaches us to really manage our time well you'd be like right i've got to do this session and i've got to do this essay so you do it and i talked earlier about how i got injured and before i got injured my i thought i was kind of in control of everything of lectures of essays of training and then when I got injured all hell broke loose so and looking back at it I was very in control when I was training because I was partying a lot I was getting up late I was just all over the place and then my academic results actually got worse when I wasn't rowing so I had way more time but my life was way less structured um so I think it's a very good question and it some of the girls might not know if they should carry on playing sport or carry on rowing when they go to uni. But for me, it forced structure of me, which I really like and also I think benefited rowing um, and the academics. Yeah, well, I, I rode with guys who made the first eight, won national titles, raced at Henley and got first in engineering. And like, it's it's very doable. And, and you will have an, the most amazing experience for it. Whereas some people, I, I don't, I have no idea what they did at uni, yeah. um, but they certainly didn't fulfil them themselves very well. Yeah. Right. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Uh, we re- all really appreciate your time uh, that you've taken out today. Um, we're really lucky at Perkins to have access to such great people to talk to. Um, to the to the rowers, thank you for choosing to watch this first chat in the series. Okay and looking forward to the next athlete hot seat which we'll hopefully do in a couple of weeks time okay so to the rowers thank you very much and goodbye and matt and george thanks again so much